Jesus opens up in this part of our text in verse 12 saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So here's Jesus saying, the world's in darkness and he's the light uh, that is going to light up the world. Now, this is not, we've been reading uh, John's gospel carefully, so this doesn't come as a surprise because John already set this up for us in that preview. Remember where he gives away everything that's going to happen through the gospel in that opening preview? Chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, we already learned. In him, that's Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. <clears throat> but did we really need John, the gospel writer, to tell us that this world is in darkness? Couldn't we have figured this out for ourselves? Uh, we look around at the world that has war, that has terrorism, that has corruption and lies even among our leaders, our politicians, and we all uh, look out when they, when they find out to be corrupt in their workings and no one seems to notice that the actual journalists who are reporting on the politicians, holding them to account, many of them are corrupt. And we've come to understand this in some measure, haven't we? We have a suspicion now of mainstream media and even that fools us into thinking that the non-mainstream media, that they're not also uh, filled with liars as well. It's like the whole world. You can't trust anyone. The world is in darkness, darkness, filled with darkness. In every sphere of life, what do you have in the workplace? You have the employer who, who seeks to exploit the employers and the employer is a trying to rip off their bosses and rot the system. Everywhere we look, there's some kind of corruption. Sports, it's all filled with drug cheats so much that they're not actually cheating because everybody's doing it anyway, so it's not cheating. Social media, what's the biggest outlet of our, our, our communication these days? The internet is, depending on the statistics you read, it's either one third or one half, some massive percentage of it is filled with pornography. That is, that, that here we have uh, moral darkness in our communication, in every sphere. I remember saying to a friend of mine in the entertainment industry years ago how every part of life, and i just become a Christian this time, every part of life, the whole world is a scam. Everything is a scam. There's, there's, there's some darkness everywhere. And in the entertainment industry, yeah, what you know is who you know and all those sorts of things. The whole world and Christians get surprised. They watch a movie or a TV program and they go, you know, that, that would have been a good program. But why did they have to slip that bit of violence or bad language or sexual immorality or whatever it is and get as though... It shouldn't have been there, but the whole world is in darkness. Of course it is. Darkness everywhere. Now, of course, we say, <clears throat> but I expect things to be different in the church. Right? Whoa. And so we get surprised when we find that there's bad things go on in the church. And don't the unbelieving world uh, love to remind us when some evil does happen in the name of Jesus, even from the clergy Darkness, the 1,000 years before the Reformation, wasn't called the Dark Ages for nothing. One of that part of the darkness was that the, the gospel of Jesus was suppressed by the church before the Reformation. But then when the Reformation this comes, does everything, does everything work out perfectly? Then no, there's ongoing struggles. Even in the church, as we've learned earlier in this gospel, when Jesus said Satan can actually get his own people into the church. 
hypocrites in the church. And therefore the church has to be continually reformed, just as Jesus warned us to watch out for false prophets, watch out for false teachings and so on. Because today in the church, the primary means with which Christians gain their practice and doctrine, where is it? It's in the Bible, isn't it? Well, no, that's not the main place that Christians get their practice and doctrine from. They get it from what other Christians are doing. Well, if everybody else believes this or does this, it must be okay. So that becomes the measure of truth rather than the light of God's word. So we've got darkness leading the darkness. Now, in some measure, of course, even the people in the world can tell you this, there's darkness in the world. They just don't see the extent of it. You, you see it reflected in, in movies and so on, uh, evil versus good and a light versus dark. You ever seen Star Wars? Uh, I haven't seen it. I slept through it, but apparently it's about light versus, <laughs> light versus dark. But anyway, the movie makers are even projecting this idea that there is evil versus good, there's dark versus light, not realising that they are actually the actors themselves in this big movie of the world that's being played out that is filled with darkness. Darkness in every area. Society is so in moral darkness, we can't even agree on issues of life and death. Haven't you ever heard anyone say to you, well, everyone knows what's right and wrong, you don't kill anybody, and yet we can't agree on whether it's right to kill people or not. We can't agree on abortion or euthanasia or stem cell research. Look what's going on in America at the moment. The whole world's in uproar about a right to kill or not to kill babies before they're born. Which is it? You know, We don't know even right and wrong when it comes to life and death. Such is the moral darkness our world is in. <clears throat> but Surely, you can trust yourself, can't you? How about if we got that video up on the screen of your thoughts for the last 24 hours and we just pick out the best bits, what rating would it get? <laughs> and we see all of what, not only what you think, but what you really think about other people when you're talking to them or what you really your motives are, whether it's for yourself or for others, and the darkness exposed. And you, everybody finds out that you are actually... You, you know, the thing is that it's like when you're actually in the physical dark and your eyes sort of adjust. You know how your eyes can adjust to, to darkness? That's what happens morally with us. We're so used to being... Uh, secret hypocrites inside our heads that we kind of get used to it. That's just the way we, we think. Of course nobody else knows what I'm thinking. That's okay because I've got that little secret to myself. Can't see anything wrong with it. But it's in us. <clears throat> We've got this stuff in us. I was talking to a Buddhist one time about this darkness and said, look, we've got this darkness in it, our sins, our thoughts inside us. How can we ever get rid of it? It's like a glass of water and you, it's filled with dirt. It's corrupted with dirt. It's got dirt all through it. How could you ever get rid of the dirt? You can't just pull the dirt out. It's in there. How could we ever get rid of this darkness? It's like that glass of water with the dirt in it. And he says, ah, grasshopper, you just stay still and let the dirt fall to the bottom. It's all clear. I went, wow, that's good. That's great. I said, what happens when you move the glass, you know? It's gonna, dirt's going to go up again. It's just like you when you move, as long as you stay still. But what happens if you move? The dirt, it's in there, it's in there. All you did was fake it. All you did was give a fake outward appearance that, the, oh, it's all clear. But as soon as you move, it was actually in there all along. You didn't get rid of it at all. How can we get rid of this darkness? Let alone, how could we... <clears throat> 
ever imagine that we could get to heaven when heaven is a place where no darkness can ever enter. Revelation 21, 27. Nothing, nothing impure, no darkness could ever enter. How could we ever think we could get to heaven? If one little bit of darkness got into heaven, then heaven would be come as corrupt as this place is on earth. No darkness. So people search, therefore, for meaning in this life to be free from the darkness or they search for truth or they search for hope. And where do they search? They search inside themselves. Isn't that the popular thing? You've got to go inside yourself. You've got you to you seek in the inner being. But if that's filled with darkness, it's just the darkness leading the dark. How, how is that going to help if you search inside yourself? If you too are part of the darkness. And what would we do if we did discover light? Well, Jesus told Nicodemus earlier in this gospel exactly what the issue is if we did find light. Let's read John chapter 3 from verse 19 to 20. <clears throat> Jesus said, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. So people don't actually want light. They like their darkness. They like being the way they are. They like not having to admit that there's something wrong in me. It's quite fascinating, really. If I ask you, has anyone ever told a lie well we know what the answer is that but late and I knocked on a door in this street uh, last week and <clears throat> a, a lady I asked the lady had, had she ever told a lie and she said never <laughs> I said never <laughs> she said I, not only have I never told a lie I've never even considered the thought has never even come to my head I thought wow I better start worshipping this lady because that's amazing he must be pure. He must be totally without darkness. Really? What would we do if light came into the world? And is, is it clear that light has come into the world? Because everybody's got their opinions on what is light, and there are many, and no people will tell you, look, there are many you guys believe in Jesus, but there are other, other religious leaders and there are many people making lots of claims. It's all so complicated. How could you ever know what true light is, even if it came along with all these confusing possibilities? But no one has ever said this. Is it really so complicated? Read again with me Jesus' words. Only read them now thinking about this. Who else has ever said anything like this? Read verse 12 again with me. Jesus says, I am the, the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We need to see the magnitude of what Jesus just said here. I am the light of the world. Now, just try and picture any other world religious leader. Pick out the Dalai Lama. He comes to Australia. He's in a press conference. And he says, I am the light of the world. And the journalists go, what? You, you mean you want to bring some light? To the... No, 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 no. I am the light of the world. And you're all in darkness. And... If you follow me, you can have some light. And they're going, right you are. Mr. Let's write this way. We'll <laughs> Whoa. No one has ever dared to say this 
in the history of the world and had it taken seriously. No other religious leader, no philosopher, no, no one has said, I am the light of the world here to light up a dark world. Jesus already claimed in this gospel that he is God, equal with God, there's only what God can do. We've seen all the different ways he's spoken about that. The eternal son who is God. And now he says he is the light of the world. <clears throat> so what would you do if light came into the world? What would you do? Well, we might do just what these people here are doing and are still doing today. Try to find a loophole because they love darkness rather than light. Read verse 13 with me. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Now, Jesus is going to go on from there to point out that he does have the witnesses, the witnesses of the Father, and this is all in the context of that miracle that happened back in chapter 5 where Jesus healed the man at the poolside, the crippled man for 38 years. And so Jesus is saying, I've got the witnesses. I've got the winner. The works of the Father prove. But before he says that, verse 14, Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I come from and where I'm going, but you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. So <clears throat> they've already been debating about the fact, well, he's born in Bethlehem, but they're going, oh, yeah, but where's this guy come from? And he's got to be born. They don't, know, they don't know that much about him. And yet they've made the, they've totally summed up their accusations against him. They're certain that he is not the Messiah. They don't want him no matter where he comes from without even knowing where he comes from. Now, you might think that's pretty silly, but that's still going on today. Is that still one of the most popular responses that people will give you? If you ask people, you get into a conversation about Jesus, they will give you, many will give you, a strong opinion about who Jesus is and then the, you ask him simply, oh, have you ever actually read uh, the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels? Do you actually know anything about him? And I go, well, no, I read it when I was a kid or uh, no, I haven't. Uh, hang on a minute, you've got this strong opinion about Jesus but you don't know where he's from, you don't know anything about him, you don't know anything about his teaching, you haven't read it, and yet you're certain that you have the right opinion about Jesus. What, what's going on there? The same thing that's going on here in our text, that these people want to come up with any excuse because they want to stay in their darkness. They don't want to come into the light and that's what's still going on today. Uh, people will believe stuff. There's an, uh, there'll be a documentary or something, a quote documentary, you know, one of those ones that's finding out the real Jesus or, or, um, or even a fiction book like The Da Vinci Code that sold 60 million copies throughout the world. And they'll grab hold of this and go, aha, now we know about the real Jesus, but they'll never go near the source documents, that is, the Gospels. They'll never go even in bother investigating and look into stuff like where the Da Vinci Code was claiming Gospels that were written centuries after Jesus. They'll never look into that stuff. In fact, Dan Brown, the writer of Da Vinci Code, was gambling on the fact that people will be so gullible, just soak in whatever he says. And he's, oh, it's based on truth. It's fiction, but it's based on truth. And they'll never look up the actual teaching of Jesus in the New Testament. They'll just swallow everything. He says, they'll never check up on me. Why? Because people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. They want anything to stay in darkness. You see, man is not neutral 
We're not neutral as we come to Jesus. We are looking for a way to be able to hang on to the way I live, to the way I think. I don't want to have to change. So they don't want to have to come out into the light. But it doesn't come without a warning. Read verse 21 with me. Once more Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? Now this is a little ironic because they're saying, will he kill himself? All the while, they were plotting to kill him. And Jesus even told them in advance, that's what you're going to do. Verse 28. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, he's talking about being the cross. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. So here he is saying, I'm telling you in advance, you're going to kill me. You're going to kill me. You're going to play out this very prophecy that I'm making right now. You're going to kill me. I'm telling you in advance what you're going to do. Oh, what are you, crazy? You're going to kill yourself? We're not, oh, who? You're crazy. But they went ahead and did it. Just like the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 8, where, uh, where the um, prophet Elisha says to Hazael, he starts, starts weeping and Hazael says, what are you weeping for? And he says, because I've seen ahead the evil you're going to do. And what does Hazael say? No, that's ridiculous. I would never do such a horrible thing. But he went ahead and did it. He went ahead and did it. He was told in advance and he still went ahead and did it. That's what is happening here. Jesus is telling these people in advance what they're going to do. And the Bible does tell us in advance what will happen. Isn't that scary? It could be. It could be the best thing if you take hold of it. But the Bible tells us in advance what's going to help happen. I'm not the, a prophet or the son of a prophet. So if I say, like I say to the children, children, this week there will come a time where you will disobey a parent or uh, not obey immediately or talk back or something. Well, come back next week and prove me wrong. Tell me you were wrong, pastor, you were wrong. I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet, so I can't. But, but what if Jesus tells you in advance what will happen? You can guarantee it will happen. And what does Jesus say here in verse 24? I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am he. You will indeed die in your sins. Have you ever had anyone say <clears throat> to you, I can't believe in a God who would have, uh, if a loving God, how could he have a place called hell? Uh, or, or people conjure up this idea of hell being some sort of cruel place or something like that. Well, here Jesus is t telling us a little something about what hell really is. It's not, not a place of cruelty. It's not a place or as one lady I said, t talking to her about this, and she goes, well, you'd have to be pretty bad to go to a place like that. <laughs> and, um, it, you know, that's the, the idea that people conjure up in their own minds about hell. It's a cruel or some place where really bad people go. But here is Jesus telling us what it really is. It's actually you dying in who you are. Just dying in your sins, in the darkness that is within. That's what hell is. Hell is living with and being exposed to 
all of the consequences of all of the darkness, of every bad thought, of every bad word, of every wrong thing I've done. It's just living with who you really are, living with yourself. Nothing cruelty, it's, it's the choices you made and they come back to you. That's all it is. What did Jesus say? Dying in your sins. Just as, a, as an aside, let's pause for a second here. Have you noticed how Jesus keeps going on about sin all the time? Seems to be often going on about sin all the time. You're going to die in your sins, you know, and, and so on. <clears throat> if ever you notice that I stop preaching about that, will you just direct me back to Jesus' teaching? Because he's on about it again. Jesus says here, you will die in your sins. And what does that mean? On the day of judgment, it'll be got like going through that door of, of death. is like going through that, one of those security arches at the, at the airport where they detect you when you've got your, any metal or drugs or anything on you. You know, when, they, when you go through the, those, that archway and if you've got something on you, beep, 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 right? If you die in your sins, you're going to go through the great security door archway. And if you still, if you die in your sins, you're going to light up like a pinball machine. It's going to go because it's still on you. If you walk through that door, I don't know whether you've ever been through one of those um, airport customs things where you've forgotten to take your keys out of your pocket or something, you know, and uh, it's all this ding, ding, ding going off and, and um, thinking, what's that, someone forgot to turn their car alarm off or something? What's that, what's that noise? And, and 50 armed guards rush at you like you're a mafia crime boss or something. And all of a sudden you realise it's not out there, this ding, 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 there's all this commotion. It's actually something attached to you. That's what the day of judgment would be like if you die in your sins. It's what's attached to you. It's what you've done. And there's no time off for good behaviour or anything. You know, I've been driving now for some... 45 years or however long it is. And I, I, you know, since I'm a Christian, I'm trying to drive the speed limit. Not once, not once has any police officer ever pulled me over and say, excuse me, driver, notice you've been driving at the speed limit. You haven't gone through any red lights recently. I just want to give you a little ticket of commendation here. You can use this. If ever you go through a red light, you can hand this over and get off. Not a chance. Why? Why does not doing good stuff count to erase your, your bad stuff? Because it's just what you should be doing anyway. It's not better than what's good. It's just doing the right thing. No, no. The only thing that's going to go ding, ding, ding when you go through that archway is you sin the things you've done wrong, thought or said, if you die in your sins. Now you go, but no one told me. Why didn't someone tell me? You know, when that, that big archway, that, that siren goes off on that day, why didn't someone tell me? Someone did tell you. Jesus told you. In fact, that's what he said in verse 24. If you wonder whether, you, whether no one told you, then listen to this. Verse 24 again. I told you, says Jesus. I told you told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Yeah, we've been learning in John's Gospel <clears throat> about how Jesus is the new exodus. The exodus where God rescued his people and took them through the promised land. 
and they worshipped in the tabernacle. What did we learn back in the preview in chapter 1? Jesus is the true tabernacle. He tabernacled among us. John chapter 1, verse 14. And Moses led the people through the wilderness in the Exodus. And now we learn it's actually Jesus. Moses led the people through the wilderness and gave them the law. Jesus is leading us through the wilderness and he is filled with grace and truth. Jesus is the true fulfillment. And as we've gone on through this gospel, we've seen all the different ways that Jesus fulfills all of the Exodus, the Passover lamb. It was Jesus. He is the true Passover lamb. All the manna from heaven that was provided for the Israelites in the wilderness wandering. What did Jesus say in this very gospel? I am the true bread of life. It was actually about him. All the, the, the water that the Israelites drank from the rock in the wilderness, Jesus has told us already that he is the one who provides the living water. It was all about Jesus. And now remember this text here, Jesus in the midst of speaking, right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, remember. Remember how the, the, the water pouring and the lights that lit up the whole of Jerusalem with this great festival that lasted for a week? And what happened at the end, they, they would turn out the lights, but that light was looking back to the wilderness wanderings in the Exodus. When, when the Israelites were going through the wilderness, how did they know where to go, and where to stop, and where to go? It was all about this light that accompanied them. Well, now we're learning that it was Jesus who is the light. Now that light that led the Israelites through the wilderness was actually Jesus. He is the true light that leads us and will lead his people way back then. Remember in this Feast of Tabernacles on the last and greatest day when the water pouring they, they, the high priest, remember, the procession through Jerusalem and he would pour out uh, the water. That's when Jesus said he is the one who provides the living water and the lights were turned off on the last and greatest day. And that's when Jesus stands up and says, this right here, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but he will have life. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? You don't have to die in your sins. You don't have to. He's offering life. How can he say that? If I've got that dirt in me, how can he say that? Because Jesus, the light, came into this dark world and he's told us in verse 28, he was lifted up to the cross. What was going on there? What was going on on the cross? Darkness came over the whole land. The darkness that represents God's judgment against our sin. You ever seen in the, in the factory, they one of those white hot laser white beams cutting into dark steel and just cuts right through you know what's going on at the cross in that darkness jesus the light is cutting through the darkness of our sin taking the full wrath and forsaking by god upon himself all of our darkness down to every last drop is taken out into Jesus' body until he could cry, it is finished. The penalty is paid and he rose again to prove that it was fully paid. No death, no sin could hold him because there was no sin left to pay. There is a way that you can walk through that doorway. 
that door of death, that great security archway, and not have that beeper go off, that you will have a rich welcome. And there is a way that you can have a light guiding you through this life. It's to believe. What did Jesus say? Take this seriously, verse 12 again. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me. It's interesting, isn't it? Whoever follows me. Not whoever can catch up to me and run as fast as I am. No, whoever fought, just get up and follow him with whatever you've got. Just get up and follow him. In other words, not a hypocritical saying, I believe in Jesus, but not following him. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So it's not a just an intellectual, yes, I believe. It's actually getting up and following him. It's getting up and, and like being here today, worshipping God together with his people because that's what he, he called us to do. It's, it's not living a secret life of hypocrisy, saying I'm a Christian on one, one hand and living a completely different life on the other. It's following him. Just as the Israelites followed the pillar of cloud with the light in the wilderness, you still can't trust yourself. But you've got a light now that you can trust. You've got a light now that can lead you, a lamp to your feet. And you can get direct access to it in his word. Are you reading it? <coughs> See, all this time you're thinking, oh, reading the Bible, that's a, a duty a Christian should do. No, no, it's light for your life. It'll strengthen you. It'll keep you going. You ever notice when you, you let it slip, things are seeming a bit more chaotic? It's light. Open it up. Read the teaching of Jesus and his apostles. Read it. Because sometimes in this wilderness we, we forget that this wilderness is filled with darkness. We're still like the world out there thinking, oh yeah, I know it's dark, but surely there's a, a bit of way through here. We can't get through here by ourselves. That's what the Israelites learned and we become a little bit like those Israelites. Remember how they were always grumbling going on about, look, you know, and if you were there, you'd be grumbling too. Look at all this dirt and sand and flies and smell of camel's breath and that's just your spouse, you know. It's just terrible, this giant. Let's get out of here. Maybe we should go off and try some other light, you know, like this light has got us stuck here. Maybe we should just, we could get through this wilderness much quicker, but Surely God's got this one wrong. We could just go off and head off into the wilderness by ourselves. The Lord's got me stuck here. That sounds stupid, doesn't it? You know, if God put the light there and said, don't move until that light moves, and like as if we're going to get in, do any better by going off on our own way. But do you know something? If you feel like you're stuck in a rut, if you feel like things are, you know, why has God got me here so long? Then that's you, that's you, just like the Israelites. Just like they had, they had to stay there. Sometimes they hold year in one spot before the light moved. How foolish it would be to move off without the light. If you're where you are now, you're there because God put you there. Start looking more at what, why God's got you there because he, he's the one who's doing it. And come back to him 
and seek him. Spend more time in prayer, asking for his leading and spend more time in his word because his word is a lamp to your feet. It's light. And if you follow the light, he will take you through. Even what you go through now, he'll take you on and he'll take you all the way to the promised land. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you have not left us to flounder. You've not left us to have to walk through that security archway, the de door of death, with our sin still clinging to us, but you've made a way through the cross of Jesus to take away our sin, that we can have a free and rich entry into your heaven and to be with you and to have a light leading us through this life. Help us to trust, Lord, that where you have placed us, and if you have us stuck in one spot for a while, this is your plan. Lead us only by your light. Help us not to go forwards without you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.